Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Terry Walls, who is Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of Iowa, where she is also a clinical researcher in multiple sclerosis. Today, we're going to be talking about her struggle with multiple sclerosis, the etiology of MS, diet and nutrition strategies, and her ongoing research studies that are quite incredible. So please stay tuned. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Terry Walls, who is Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials in the setting of multiple sclerosis. She is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner, and she's also published over 60 peer-reviewed scientific abstracts, posters, and papers. In 2018, she was awarded the Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. She is also the author of The Walls Protocol, a radical new way to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions using paleo principles and the cookbook, The Walls Protocol, Cooking for Life. In addition, Dr. Walls is also a patient living with and managing multiple sclerosis, um, which makes her just plain extraordinary given her background. So I'm going to jump right in. Thank you so much, Dr. Walls, for being with us. Terry, if you don't mind, um, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for making the time of your busy busy schedule. Thank you, Ailey. I'm I'm thrilled to have this chance to chat with you and your audience. Thank you. So, you know, we'll we'll sort of give the audience a background and jump right in. So, um, you know, what's so unique about you is your medical background. And here you were practicing and doing your thing and as, you know, typical training in medicine. And you became ill. And tell us a little bit about what were the symptoms that you began to develop and then what was diagnosed um, at that time in your life. You know, in retrospect, it all began during medical school. I had episodes of uh, discomfort here at my temple, uh, usually in my right, occasionally in my left. Uh, uh, worse if I was stressed, um, uh, didn't get much sleep. And over the next 10 years, this would become uh, more frequent, more severe, and much more electrical. Uh, and um, I would eventually go see a, phys- a neurologist. I, I took Tegretol but developed a drug rash. I tried some other drugs. Nothing helped. And I realized, okay, I've got a progressive problem. I'm just going to have to tough it out when it comes. Uh, then I had a episode of dim vision in my left eye while I was out rollerblading after work. I got a big workup, you know, uh, uh, MRI, um, heart scan, carotid scan, saw the um, eye doctor, the retinal doc. And they said, well, uh, autonomic dysfunction of the retinal blood flow don't work out so vigorously. Uh, and I, I could tell that if I was in a hot tub or a sauna, I couldn't see as well in my left eye. Mm. Uh, and no one put together my episodes of electrical face pain or my dim vision. And of course, now, Ailey, I'm, I'm so glad they did not. Because if they had, if they had told me that I was probably going to have MS, I would not have had my uh, two children. Um, mm, so I, 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 I'm very grateful that no one put it together. Uh, and then uh, after my second child, um, uh, six years after, I developed some weakness in my left leg while I'm out walking. And, um, you know, it's really quite striking. Uh, so I drag my leg home. I realize, okay, something is very wrong. Um, I see the neurologist uh, and begin, we begin the workup. And he says, you know, this could be bad or really, really bad. So, Ailey, I'm thinking, okay, really, really bad. Uh, this is clearly a progressive thing because I already, I already know I've had 20 years of worsening electrical face pain. So, actually, I'm hoping and praying for a rapidly fatal diagnosis because I, I do not want to become disabled. I don't want to be a burden for my family. Uh, three weeks later, I uh, learned that I have multiple sclerosis. Um, actually, I feel pretty optimistic that things will go well. I am um, yeah, I mean, you know, an associate professor at the University of Iowa. 
So I do some research, who, which is the very best MS center in the country. I go there uh, for second oh, opinion. Oh, it happened to be that when you were diagnosed, you're saying? Yeah. So th- no, that, then I go off to a, a, another institution, uh, one of the be- the best MS centers in the country. I see mm-hmm. their best person. I take the newest drugs. Um, and I have uh, another relapse, weakness in my right hand. Uh, I take steroids. And, but I'm getting continually slowly worse. Uh, they tell me, I mean, the progressive phase of the illness, now secondary progressive MS. I take my Dizantrone. I get to have neutropenia, fortunately without fever. Um, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting a and lot of... And neutropenia, what's neutropenia? Okay, so the, the whole reason to take mitoxantrone, which is a form of chemotherapy, is to uh, really sock it to my immune cells so they can't be attacking my brain. Uh, and one of the consequences, if you get a, a really strong effect, is the white blood cell, the neutrophils, diminish. And so mine were diminished for quite a while. So I'm thinking like, okay, I'm getting a lot for my for my effort here. But, you know, I continued to decline. I did not have an improvement in function. I'm in a tilt recline wheelchair. I do several cycles of, my, of uh, mitoxantrone. Then my neurologist says, Terry, ah, this is not helping you. I can't give you all the toxic side effects. Uh, but by that time, now um, Tysabri is released, and you know everyone's thrilled with Tysabri because that's a drug that reduces relapse rate by 68%. So I'm, I'm thrilled to take it. When I take it, Ter- yeah, Ter- Terry, tell me the core, the basis of MS. I don't know oh, if we've sure, covered that, sure. and then that would be really helpful because now you're talking about the drug therapies that you've been experimenting. Yeah. So I want to just make sure people understand at the very cellular, simple level what MS is: multiple sclerosis. So, um, it, more MS is a neuroimmune, so an immune problem that's happening in your brain, uh, in spinal cord, uh, and, and cranial nerves. In my case, that. Uh, the nerves aren't functioning properly. We know there are episodes of acute flares of disease. That's called a relapse. And then generally there's a gradual improvement. That's called a remission. On top of these episodes of acute uh, worsening uh, and improvements is this background of slow, relentless deterioration. That's the neurodegenerative component. Uh, and so in retrospect, uh, you know, if you call these little flares of trigeminal neuralgia, uh, electrical face pain, was that a relapse? Maybe. Um, I, mm-hmm. uh, aside from that, I had the uh, dim vision uh, that was clearly a relapse. I had uh, the episode of the weakness of my right hand that was clearly a relapse. But the, the, the other thing that was happening was I was getting weaker. Uh, my core muscles were less strong. It was harder to walk. Uh, it was harder to sit up, um, and I could no longer sit up in a regular desk chair. I couldn't sit at you know a, a table to eat. I had to lean back in, in a zero gravity chair. Uh, when I was staffing residents at work, I couldn't sit at the desk at a special zero gravity chair uh, where I could lean back with my knees higher than my nose. Gravity you know mm. holds me entirely in the chair. And I am really quite fortunate, even though I had really severe fatigue, um, I was mentally clear. Uh, and so uh, and I'm sure that was very beneficial being a physician, doing all the reading uh, uh, and continuous learning that we do um, well, was at least somewhat protected. But it was also clear, Ailey, that um, by the frequency and severity of the electrical face pains continued to worsen. Um, I, I was take, finally taking daily uh, gabapentin, which is a mm-hmm. uh, anti-seizure medicine, which can be very helpful for neuropathic pains. A- and that was helpful. And then when I had breakthrough pain, despite taking the maximum dose of daily gabapentin, that was incredibly uh, distressing to me. Like, okay. I, I, you know, in 2007, Ailey, I, I was coming to terms with 
it's very clear I'm going to be bedridden by my illness because, you know, it's hard and hard to set up. I'm going to, I'm beginning to have some brain fog. Like, I'm going to become probably demented. But I'm probably also going to have my electrical face pain turn permanently on. And to give your your listeners and to your context of what, of what I was enduring, you know, I'm a farm kid, so we use these cattle prods with electrical, uh, you know, shock sticks to get the, the cattle and the hogs to move, and they squeal and they scream and they run away because the, the electrical pain, you know, it's, it's, ter- it, it, it's really quite profound. So it's sort of like a, a, a cattle prod was hitting me right here or right here. I get this intense electrical jolt, I, and I have this involuntary grimace. Mm. Uh, yeah, I try really hard, because, you know, I'd be trying to work in the midst of all this, so I try really hard to not grimace, but, you know, eventually I, I couldn't control that. Uh, and it'd be just for an instant. Now, in comparison, I've had broken bones much more intense than a broken bone. I've had surgeries. Mm much more intense than post-op pain. You had pregnancy. I, I, I had labor, <laughs> active labor, much more intense than active labor. Right, right. It, it, and at its peak, when, when I get the jolt of pain, it overwhelms all of my other sensory inputs. So the world becomes white, for instance, because I can't see. I, I'm blinded by pain. Hmm. And uh, when, when it's on and active, I'm getting the jolts, a breeze, on my face will trigger the pain. A light, you know, a bright light would trigger the pain. Sound, you know, the dog barking would trigger the pain. Chewing triggers the pain. Mm. Talking triggers the pain. Swallowing triggers the pain. And I, I also know that the uh, yeah. Uh, that the natural history of having trigeminal neuralgia with MS is that it eventually turns on continuously. Mm. And when that happens, people kill themselves because all of their sensory input it is, becomes this intense electrical pain. I, and so I had, um, I, you know, this is a big conversation I had with my spouse was that I rewrote my durable medical power of attorney so that if I stopped speaking and stopped swallowing, there'd be no IV fluids, no uh, tube feeds. And so I had to rewrite my durable medical power of attorney. I I rewrote my uh, living will. I was like, okay. It, It would be extremely painful last, you know, 10 days, two weeks while you wait for dehydration to finally make you comatose and let you die. But uh, the end would, the end would, would eventually right. come. Right. And, you know, I, I, in 2007, I could not sit up. I, 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 I was still able to go to work. I, I, I could be in the zero gravity chair. My chief of staff, you know, and actually, I think he was entirely right to do this. He had called me in in July to say he's assigning me the traumatic brain injury clinic. Uh, and then he described the job. I'd be part of a multidisciplinary team. I'd be doing the primary care for these vets who'd had a traumatic mm-hmm. brain injury and were having persisting symptoms. And I'd have to do the exam, write the notes. There'd be no residence. And as he described the, the, the job, I'm thinking, physically, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. I came home and told Jackie, and she said, there's no way you can do that. I said, yeah, I know. Um, And so in January, I'm going to go to this clinic, and either I can do the job or I can't, and then I have to apply for disability. But, you know, I think God was whispering in John's ear because two weeks after I, I got that, you know, very tough meeting, I got to review a uh research study that I, I was reviewing for the institute, the um, institutional uh, review boards. And that's the committee that reviews uh, clinical trials to be sure that they're all be mm-hmm. safe and appropriate. Right. And they were using electrical stimulation of muscles uh, in uh, uh, a clinic where people had, had a traumatic spinal cord injury. So I thought, wow, that sounds really interesting. I wonder if that could help me. 
Uh, so you know, I do a quick PubMed search. There's only 212 articles. Like, okay, you know, I, I, it took a while to get through all those abstracts. <clears throat> and so then I, I wanted to buy my own device. Uh, and Jack said, no, honey, you can't do that. But let's talk to your physical therapist. And fortunately, the physical therapist I was seeing had a, an athletic practice, and he used mm. e-stim. He goes, you know, this hurts a lot, Terry. You know, I, I can grow you bigger muscles, but I don't know that your brain can talk to those bigger muscles. I might be making it harder to walk. But he let me have a test session. He's right, it hurt really bad. But when it was over, I, I, man, it just did such wonderful stuff for my mood. So the endorphins, you the talk endorphins. about. endorphins, yeah. I said, yeah. That's amazing. And so did you try acupuncture? Because when you think, when I think of electrical stimulation, I think of the meridians and I think of some of that work. Did, did well, that ever come you know, into I, play I, at that time? Or? Not that time, but I did eventually decide, you know what, mm -hmm. let's give that a whirl too. So I, I did try some acupuncture as well. <clears throat> yeah, and so I, I did the East stem mm -hmm. At the same time that I was discovering East stem I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. And I took mm. their course on neuroprotection, which, by the way, was, you know, I really loved. It was a lot of mitochondria, a lot of biochemistry. It was really hard because I remember I'm having some brain fog here. Right. Uh, and uh, But I now have a longer list of supplements. I'd already been on the paleo diet for about five years. I had and describe of, paleo diet, if you don't oh, mind, yeah, real quick, yeah. because some people don't know the exact you know, components Terms, of it. Yeah. So I had been on a low-fat vegetarian diet since medical school. So I thought mm -hmm. that was, you know, heart healthy, the way to go. And when I got the MS, I read the Swank book. I thought, okay, you know, go really low fat. Uh, so um, lots of beans, rice, vegetables. Then my neurologist had mentioned the work of Lauren Cordain. I read his books on the paleo diet, read his mm -hmm. papers. And after a big meditation and thoughtfulness, I, I went back to eating meat. So I, I, I drop all grains, all legumes, and dairy. I'm eating more meat, um, I'm uh, eating vegetables, and the next year I'm, I'm in a recline wheelchair. Yeah, so basically paleo describes sort of an anthropologic perspective on what we should be eating in modern day life. Um, there's other yeah. diets that fit other people necessarily, but in general, paleo has gained a lot of attention because it is, in, is consistent with millions of years of, of human evolution. And it's um, really nutrient dense, you know, because uh, mm -hmm. you take out the sugar, you take out the processed foods. If you eat vegetables and you eat meat, fish, poultry, it's a very nutrient dense uh, diet. It's it's and it's different than the dietary guidelines diet. So a lot of the mm -hmm. conventional physicians uh, and dietitians uh, would at first really condemn the paleo diet uh, because it took out dairy and it took out whole and grains. cholesterol. They were worried about the meat and then yeah. maybe the stearic acid and some of the fats that are in uh, in meats that may be contributing to heart disease, colon cancer. So there's that. Yeah, and the KMAO. So uh, there are huge. Uh, there's a lot of criticism uh, of the paleo diet. But you know, at the time, I started that actually um, the year before I got in the wheelchair, then I'm in the wheelchair. But Ailey, I, I felt like, okay, I'm doing something. Yeah. yeah. There's a scientific rationale. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a long time to rebuild the brain, the nervous system. It's about seven years. Uh, if, if we look at it, you know, molecule by molecule, it's like, okay, I... I, I don't know how long it's going to take, and maybe all I can get is to slow things down because all of my physicians, every one of them, mm -hmm. and I'd seen quite, quite a few neurologists over the years, they always mm -hmm. said, you're in the progressive phase, There's, the name of the game is to slow the decline. So I knew right. that you know, I wasn't going to get better, I was just going to slow the decline. And um, as I you know, describe what I'm doing, you know, I'm doing electrical stimulation, I'm doing more supplements, not to get better, because I, Ailey, I know I cannot get better. I've accepted that. I, but, you know, I, I can walk a little bit in the house. I can feed myself yet. That's worth a lot. 
that's worth a lot considering where you had come from. And, and that was a big, that had a lot to do with your diet and your, your basic yeah. learning from functional medicine. And do you mind if I show pictures that you have on your website that you oh, were basically, yeah. I think this is really telling. I'm just leaning into the mic too much probably, but it, yeah. you know, here you were when you're, you were first diagnosed and when you started the process of paleo and functional medicine training, and then here you are a year, later. Um, a year later. And I think that's pretty remarkable. And I think that's why, you know, everyone is listening to you who has, you know, autoimmune diseases, but particularly MS, because you've lived it, you're living it now. And, you know, people want to hear what you have to say, given your research background and the work you do. You know, when I recovered... And, you know, stunned myself uh, and my physicians, you know, I walk into his office. Um, and that was really quite funny. They were looking around. And I'm sure that they didn't realize it was me. So I finally stood up, was waving my hand like, hey, hey it's Dr. Wallace. And I'm like, oh, my God, Dr. Wallace, you're walking. Um, yeah, and so I, it was stunning how rapidly I went from being unable to sit up to being able to uh, walk. Um, again, uh, around the hospital, uh, then when I got on my bike and we biked for the first time in six years, uh, you know, my, my son is crying. He, he's 16. My daughter, 13, she's crying. Jackie's crying. I'm crying. And then <clears throat> that was in May. Then in October, Jackie signs me up for a courage ride, 18.5 uh, hmm. miles. No, really? Uh, bike ride. Uh, uh, bike ride. It, and, yeah. you know, we're like, well, however far you go, it's going to be pretty heroic. Um, and so I, I had to lay down and rest three times, but I finished 18.5 miles. And once again, you know, everybody's crying. Wow. Uh, and of course, this changes how I think about disease and health. It will change the way I practice medicine. And in the traumatic brain injury clinic, which I've, I've been at now, uh, actually quite successfully, my, 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 my partners are saying, well, there's nothing we can do. We'll, we'll give you these... Uh, antipsychotic, so you don't get into a rage and, and hurt anyone. <clears throat> and we'll give you a, a smartphone, uh, and, and we'll just have to watch and wait. And I come in and say, "No, no, there's a whole lot we can do. We're gonna, we're gonna have you start taking up some salts baths. We're gonna fix, get you to improve your diet." Uh, and I, I would convince people uh, to try either a gluten-free vegetarian diet or a paleo diet, or at least work on improving their diets. And you could tell who I saw, because those folks would still have their spouses. They would still have their jobs right. six months later when they came back. And their severe headaches were much less. Their light sensitivity was less. And then in prim my primary care clinic, the, the, the residents are seeing the patients. So now I only get about five minutes instead of 20 minutes. So I, I have a tiny, 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 tiny time with the with the vet but i'm convincing about half these vets to make big changes on their diet to get right. rid of the processed food begin eating vegetables um I, I, my my basic recipe is ask them if they like bacon well yes yeah, so, okay <laughs> fry up some bacon take it out of the pan chop up the bacon put the vegetables in for two minutes if, if it's green leafies just enough so that the leafies uh, wilt, put the, bake, the chopped bacon back in and serve. And they'd uh, be like, great bacon, I love my bacon. And if but it's not, now you're getting all the good stuff in. And if it's not tasty enough, double the bacon and do it again. <laughs> oh, and you know, pe people change their diet. Yeah. Their blood pressure's improved, their blood sugar's improved, their pain reduced. And my residents were like, oh my God. Yeah, and then I began so convincing, what about, yeah. convincing the residents that if you want your patients to improve their diets, you have to improve your diets because you got to speak from your own experience. Oh, geez, that's true. And what it, you know, it, during this time where you're learning and you're educating yourself and you're making gains physically, emotionally, I'm sure as well, what were you telling the clinic that you were supposedly a patient of in terms of what they should be doing or could be doing? In other words, wasn't there a well, disconnect between what you're doing and learning and then having this institution or this fine yeah. MS clinic telling you sort of Western approach only and you maybe know, not incorporating these things? Yeah, what was sort of interesting, what, when I walked into the clinic, because you know, they hadn't seen me walk into the clinic for four years, uh, and I said, and I want to get off, because uh, at that point I'm self-stuffed, and I said, 
and I want to get off this drug. I just said, well, okay. So he, he tapered, he had me off, and then he kept flying my uh, MRIs. And, I, and I, you know, I had no new enhancing lesions already for several years. There were no new enhancing mm -hmm. lesions. And he said, okay, well, th this is going to be safer um, for you to not be uh, on these drugs. You clearly haven't had relapses in a long time. And we don't have drugs for secondary progressive MS. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've been off disease-modifying drugs since... Uh, March of 2008, with my neurologist blessing and my MRIs look uh, uh, really marvelous. I still have some of my lesions, uh, and my neurologist says, you know, th they're old. We don't expect them to to disappear. But what is key is you clearly have remyelinated and mm -hmm. bypassed all of that stuff. Uh, right, uh, because the brain is plastic, basically, neuroplasticity, and, and that's one of the key drivers and what keeps you going and the research going is that people think that what you've been given genetics and otherwise is one area that people can't change, right? And people also believe that once damage is done, particularly of the brain, I mean, we know that bone remodels, we know that, um, you know, all sorts of tissues, vascularization, mod, you know, changes and remodels, right? When you have a heart attack, your body yeah. finds blood vessels to create around to get more blood flow. So our bodies are always compensating, but no one really thinks the brain compensates or at least remodels. Yeah. So tell us about some of that stuff you know, that you know. In term my uh, neurologist, my, actually my chief of medicine, mm -hmm. Paul Rothman, uh, uh, gave me the job of Right, getting a case report written up on, on my own recovery. Uh, so I did that with my uh, treating neurologist, physical therapist. Uh, uh, we wrote, wrote, wrote that up, got it published. Then my chief uh, of medicine said, I want you to do a safety and feasibility study. Uh, so it took me about a year to get the protocol written out, what I clearly had done, and to get it approved. Um, my neurologist was our, on our study team. Uh, and we've got a PhD student uh, to do my study, basically, as her dissertation. And a group in Canada uh, gave us, a, you know, just a little bit of pilot seed money so I could buy the supplements that we put people on, uh, and uh, I, we got uh, the electrical devices. And, and we had uh, 20 people with secondary and primary progressive MS who implemented uh, what I did. 19 made it uh, to the 12 months. And as a group, we held their walking stable, which is really stunning. Mm -hmm. Half of them had clinically meaningful improvement and half continued to decline. The fact that, and you'd expect all of them to decline 10 to 20%. And we had a remarkable improvement for the group in terms of improved quality of life and reduced um, um, anxiety, improved verbal uh, reasoning, improved spatial reasoning, uh, less anxiety, less depression. I mean, overall, really remarkably uh, positive uh, outcomes. And the neurology community thought I was yeah. incredibly dangerous because by this time, you know, my TED Talk is out, uh, a number of uh, organizations are wanting me on their podcast interviews. I'm talking about my story. I'm talking about the research I'm doing. And the MS neurology uh, experts are very afraid that I'm creating this desire by patients to avoid drugs and to use diet and lifestyle. So I feel yeah, like I'm, I'm being condemned. Yeah, and listen, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing you as an, as an integrative medicine trained, and certainly I know much about functional <clears throat> medicine. And I think there's a certain delight that I get when my patients recover, do good things without the need of pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And they go back to their primary and they go back to all their specialists. And, and it's sort of educating them through the patient's, bent, you know, um, improvements. And I think it's, it's a little bit of a kind of an F you to the Western way of, of work. But I will have to say that, you know, medications in my world as a rheumatologist are quite critical when they're needed when they're oh, needed. Totally. And so I kind of wanted to pick your brain about that because there's no question success comes from, and I agree with this, diet, nutrition, and lifestyle, and sleep, and managing stress, and drinking water quality, and all those things. 
But pharma plays some roles in this, oh, no doubt. And and how do you incorporate that into your philosophy and your practice with your patients? So I, I will tell people that uh, it depends on the severity of your of your disability, uh, the severity of your lesion load, as to how strongly. I'm going to tell you, you really ought to be doing disease modifying drugs plus diet right. and lifestyle. Everyone should do diet and lifestyle. If you have no fixed disability, small lesion load, and your preference in your heart is, I'm afraid of those drugs, I'm, I'm reading the side effect profile, and it scares me, I want to do diet and lifestyle and see how far I can get. I, I think that's okay. If when you read the side effect profile, and you read the disability risk profile, what you're more afraid of is, I don't want to be in a wheelchair. Oh, my God, that, right. that, that would be catastrophic. I'm going to take the drugs, right. and I'll do diet and lifestyle. I want people to read the risk profile, think about their disability risk, and then in your heart, you got to do what makes the most sense. Okay. Uh, and whatever you do, drugs or no drugs, diet and lifestyle is critical. Yeah, I, I think the neurology community became less upset when, when I said, look, I'm not anti-drug. I took those drugs. Right. I was ha thrilled to take right. those drugs. I took right. the drugs when I knew I was taking, getting a risk of 2% uh, acute leukemia every time I took uh, mitoxantrone, but I was thrilled to take it because I, I didn't want to be disabled. So I tell people that you got you to gotta read the risk profile, you got to read the disability risk profile, and then listen to your heart. But whatever right. you do, for sure you do diet and lifestyle. Right. And, and part in your background, talking about sort of, you know, load in terms of the brain and the lesions, you know, you're also there to meter out sort of the, the honest Western um, scientific information you have as to the progression. And so you're on a sort of a time balance. You know, I say that to my patients, look, let's do it three months, six months. Let's reevaluate this in terms of just sort of what the dysfunctional component from those um, lesions could be um, as yeah, opposed absolutely. to sort of... Yeah, are, yeah. Are no, we I think getting that's getting everything cooled off in time. Cause with yeah. with MS, I, we can do MRIs every six months, and right. I, I certainly have seen people come in, twenty lesions, say no to the drugs, and want to do diet and lifestyle. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I just have to remind you that that many lesions puts you at big risk for a wheelchair very rapidly. And, yeah. and your neurologist is going to be very worried about you. I'm very worried about you. Now, I have seen, had those people do diet and lifestyle, and the, the lesions were, were apparently all new because they all went away. And they're like, had ter terrific success. I've also had people with those 20 lesions. Things are getting better, but they still have 10 lesions. I decide, you know what, I'm going to take the drugs now. So right. things are improving. But, it, but it's way, and it should weigh in their mind that, okay, things are still really active. I don't want to be in the wheelchair. It's easier to, uh, to save my function than to get it back. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and, you know, ultimately, it's not a weakness to be on medications. I have a lot of patients who deny themselves, deny themselves. And, and sometimes it's a brace, right? Sometimes you are on medications to get you to the next step of change because diet and lifestyle is much harder than just taking a medicine often, you know? So yeah. I think, um, how you meter that out is actually brilliant. And that's, that's kind of how I work with my, my lupus and rheumatoid patients. There's a, there's a level of dysfunction that you can't disregard that's looking under the hood and you have to sort of weigh that out in terms of the choices and, and how fast and how you meet the patient, how, how fast they want to progress in terms of their change. And, and so, I, I acknowledge that uh, I mean, I want them to read the the um, side effect profile of these drugs, yeah. so yeah, that they sure. understand that the drugs um, have huge side effects and huge risks. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and, and you can have a fatal side effect. Absolutely true, but not taking the drugs in the natural history of the disease is pretty terrible too. Right, uh, and uh, and so having that. Uh, honest conversation, I think, is uh, very, very important. 
That's great. Do you, um, since you just mentioned MRIs, and I know that, you know, for diagnosis of MS and for certainly management in terms of seeing how things progress, does it bother you using gadolinium? I've had issues with MRIs of the oh. breast, wondering if that's really going to cause more harm. I know they, they yeah. changed up. And I, again, I'm not trying to get people to refuse tests that are needed, but I'm just consciously thinking about the tests. I think they get overlooked. Yeah, breast yeah. MRIs that I go through, you know, it's like, am I making a trade-off here for saving breasts versus having some type of long-term issue with gadolinium? It's the best we have, but just thinking about what your thoughts. Yeah, gad gadolinium yeah. is a risk. Um, you know, uh, and how frequently should you take a gadolinium right. scan? Uh, the neurologist would love to get one every six months. Um, right. uh, if people are going to do gadolinium, uh, then I uh, certainly want to put them through a pretty thoughtful detox pre and post. Um, when, in my own recovery, which is sort of interesting, you know, so I'm two years into my recovery. I'm uh, biking, hiking for hours, uh, so really in, in great shape. And I go like, yeah, I wonder how toxic I was. So I do a 24-hour challenge test on my urine. And like, oh, oh my goodness, I am diffusely toxic. Uh, on all these heavy metals, lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, uh, uh, thorium, thallium, uh, and gadolinium was like 100 times the, the upper limit. Uh, so I was like, wow, I thought I was detoxing. I'm going to really ramp up my oral detox regimen much more vigorously. And then I check it again two years later, so now four years into my recovery, and I'm pleased to say everything was gone. Okay. Uh, so it's managed to clear everything. So uh, now I uh, talk to my patients about the importance of making sure they're getting plenty of NAC to help with the clearance of the gallon. And acetylcysteine. Yeah, and acetylcysteine, uh, that's really helpful. They could use taurine or uh, lipoic acid, which are other sulfur-containing amino acids. Lots mm -hmm. of cabbage family vegetables, mm -hmm. maybe a little dim. Uh, diendolmethane uh, to help with that clearance. Uh, and, and this sort of, people might disagree with me on this uh, because in the animal models, a high salt diet accelerates uh, the animal models of uh, uh, MS. Mm -hmm. But a high salt diet and lots of water increases your detox capacity. So I think. And I talk with folks that, you know, toxins are Is that sea salt issue. or sodium uh, you're talking uh, about? Yeah, sea salt. Sea salt, yeah. Because yeah. that has the electrolytes. It has the potassium yeah. and chloride, and it's very well balanced. Yeah. So I prefer uh, lots of sea salt uh, and mm -hmm. uh, lots of sulfur-containing amino acids. Now, depending, it, 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 depending on your own SNPs for how you metabolize sulfur and probably your what microbiome. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, so the genetic variation that we all have, yeah. you're human to human, that how I metabolize sulfur will be a little different than how you metabolize it, Ailey. So uh, apparently I can take lots and lots of sulfur. I have no problem with that. Some people can only take one or two capsules of mm -hmm. um, a sulfur-containing amino acids, and they go beyond that. They don't feel as well. I'm like, okay, so you've, you've just maxed out your sulfur handling capacity. That's all I need you to do. So you can be sure that you are eliminating uh, these compounds a little more effectively. But foods do this too. I mean, a lot of what your protocol, the Walls protocol is very well known. And, and basically when I'm hearing supplements, supplements are excellent. And of course, I would love people to take high quality supplements, which I think are very different than low quality and over the counter and local yeah. pharmacy brands. I think people don't realize that brands definitely matter in terms of quality and clinical value. But food, you, you, your, your protocol is, is very rife with sulfur-containing vegetables and, and all and, sorts of... And those of foods induce those enzymes that yeah. are phase one, phase two detox enzymes. Yeah. They also uh, induce uh, glutathione in the brain, which is important for uh, uh, some of the inhibitory neurotransmitters, so it's very calming for the brain. And keep in mind, I designed it that way uh, for my brain and for detox. Because I, I had right. identified early on that mitochondria were key and that, you know, I was an artist before becoming mm -hmm. a physician. So I did oil painting, I did metallurgy. Um, so I had, I knew I had a lot of heavy metals. 
And, you know, Ailey, I, I was so thrilled to do gross anatomy that I'd go back to the lab, unwrap the cadavers, make all these beautiful drawings. So I probably had three times the formaldehyde dose of all of my classmates because I was so thrilled to get to do gross anatomy. I did it from home. I actually watched all the anatomy at home until I had to come in for the exams because it made me so sick. Ugh. Because the smell was pervasive. But you clearly had a different love for that, that painting and drawing. I, I, ugh. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the smell was bad, but oh my God. It, it, um, there are so few artists that would ever get to do what I was getting to do. Sure. Sure. And, and given, and well, but you also five generation Iowan. So let's, let's talk about that. Tell me yeah. a little bit about you growing up on the Iowa farms where, you know, in Iowa, I will, I don't want to make the direct connection, but in terms of brain health, the pesticides that are used in the Midwest yeah. are pretty pervasive. And well, let's, let's you know, talk a little bit what are your thoughts? That. So my, my dad, uh, yeah, he's grew up on uh, Iowa farm. I, uh, mm-hmm. and, my uh, sister, I was born when I was nine. She died as an infant. Very traumatic for both my mom and my dad. I uh, and then I think it was probably uh, a couple years after that he began having pain in his legs, uh, and that ultimately it was a progressive uh, sensory disturbance, and then uh, became a motor disturbance. Uh, eventually, I, I got him. Uh, to be evaluated at my hospital when I was uh, still at Marshall Clinic. And he was diagnosed with mononeuritis multiplex. That's mm-hmm. a autoimmune condition, which is damaging his peripheral nerves. Uh, and my mom's mother had a autoimmune condition damaging her lungs. She had pulmonary fibrosis, and she had an auto, neuro, autoimmune neurologic problem that gave her sensory and motor disturbances. And she ultimately was unable to walk and and died from the complications of her autoimmune disease. We know after World War II, the um, farming radically changed uh, and we quit doing crop rotation, started using more herbicides, more pesticides, more herbicides to control weeds such as atrazine, and then uh, pesticides to control the uh, cutworms and nematodes that would uh, attack the corn. Uh, and I remember helping my dad, so sort of shocking, helping him with the pesticide and herbicide applications, filling up the tanks. Uh, I would ride on the top of the uh, little tractor like a horse, and we'd you know go spray uh, the fields. And I also now know that a you know, most of the farms, we had our, our private wells that uh, drank that water. Right. The, the private wells are contaminated with atrazine, which has since been banned. Uh, I know in Europe, I believe it's banned here in the United States now uh, as well. Uh, and uh, those, all of those herbicides, pesticides uh, interact with my mitochondria mm-hmm. and probably my dad's mitochondria. Uh, and so, was that part of why he developed his autoimmune problem? Almost, almost certainly. My was that part of why my grandmother developed her mm-hmm. autoimmune problem? I would think so. Is that why several of my uncles on my mom's side have severe inflammatory bowel disease? Probably. Now, I also know that on my mom's side, uh, a number of my aunts have severe macular degeneration and became blind. Uh, and, you know, my, my physicians look at my eyes and say, well, you have a few things uh, there on your retina, um, but you're eating all the right stuff. And so, you know, there certainly has been no progression and you don't really have cataracts. And for the fact that you've had optic neuritis, you see extraordinarily well. And that, you know, um, the, the progressive changes that would be typical of people with optic neuritis and progressive MS uh, are, are not right. being observed in my case. So you're actively affecting your epigenetics. And epigenetics meaning you were given this environment and your genetics, which, of course, you know, there's a component. Although they say MS, when I was reading a lot about it last night even, 
you know, they say it's not inherited. So well, I think that's probably that. not. Yeah. So let me talk about that. So if I have a parent, it's three to five percent. If I have a sibling, it's like two to three percent. So my, right. um, but there are a few genes that will increase that risk to more like 15 percent. That we identified 300 genes that increase the risk for MS. Each, mm-hmm. For most of these genes, it's about a half percent to a one percent. So not a lot. So it's this complicated interaction. You have to have the genes that put you at risk. Mm-hmm. You have to have one of the infections that put you at risk. It, and as I look at the number of folks who have an autoimmune diagnosis or autoantibodies, it looks like that's about half of us. Who, who have either the autoimmune diagnosis or have autoantibodies without a autoimmune diagnosis. And so look at the risk of the 16 different microbes that have been associated with a higher risk for autoimmunity. I'm thinking, oh, that must be 90% of us, really. So then the next, then, okay, step three. Step three is epigenetics. That's all the stuff you talk about and I talk about daily. That's what you're eating. How much you move, how well you sleep, uh, what's your uh, social interconnectedness, are you lonely, Uh, do you have a spiritual religious practice, Uh, do you have uh, positive self-talk, are you always running yourself down, Um, are you bathed in toxins, are you eating good food, are you eating processed junk? And the more uh, health promoting your environment is, the more resilient you'll be to the um, step one and step two, and, and you won't go on to develop autoimmunity. But the right. less um, um, nurturing your environment is, the more likely it is that step one and step two will proceed to step three and autoantibodies and autoimmune and disability and a miserable life because you have this overwhelming autoimmune problem. Right. So you have this genetic template that has its, you know, you can be more susceptible to a variety of diseases, but it's your epigenetics, which are the proteins that sit within the genes that either allows those genes to get expressed as a clinical disease or not. And what you're describing in your work and what I try to describe and do in my work is basically say you have more control over your health than you think you do or that it's been told to you. And that by doing these certain things that we know are now evidence-based, diet, nutrition, social, spiritual, community, clean water, clean food, that you can really make a dent in not only developing those diseases, but also how you manage them, which is what you've done so well in your life and your research. Um, can I ask you about those viruses? Let's talk about Epstein-Barr virus, and let's also oh, talk yeah. about vitamin D, because I, I don't want to overwhelm. You know, we yeah. have not that much time left, but it's so critical because everyone hears that, you know, the further away you live from the equator and the lower your vitamin D level directly correlates to risk. Um, and also newer information now about Epstein-Barr virus exposure, which most of us have no control over, um, can predispose you to higher rates of not only just MS, but also including lupus and some other autoimmune diseases, which is very interesting. You know, so Epstein-Barr virus, I'm going to also add in the coronavirus and probably the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, um, herpes simplex, uh, um, HERF. So, so there are a number of viruses that have uh, been associated with a higher risk of autoimmunity. Uh, and so there's a lot of excitement. There's a big paper that came out with Epstein-Barr uh, being very closely linked to uh, MS. And so people mm-hmm. would like to think that if I just took an antiviral drug for uh, these various viruses, then I won't have autoimmunity. I doubt that'll be that simple because, we, you know, think we, we thought we could just take antibiotics and that would take care of uh, the infectious disease. Mm-hmm. But it turns out we need a lot of those microbes, so a broad spectrum antibiotic uh, really creates terrible health consequences. I predict that if people lean into, I'm going to take an antiviral to deal with the Epstein-Barr or whatever, bar, you know, coronavirus, whatever it is, mm-hmm. that that will not turn out very well because we probably need those viruses, those bacteria, because we co-evolved. Uh, and they, Balance. they yeah. probably contribute to our health in ways that we do not yet understand. My preference is that we, we, ha- we do have to control be better at controlling those viruses because they're still in my body. All those microbes I've ever encountered, they're still in my body. 
the reason I'm healthy is my immune cells doing a great job of keeping everything under control. So I have a great vitamin D level, great nutrition, I get great sleep, uh, positive self-talk, and things are going well. As soon as I get too much on my plate, which I'm prone to do because I, I like changing the world, I, I love what I do, um, and I start not sleeping well at night, I stay up too much, I do too many uh, uh, lectures around the world, take too many flights in one month, then I'm not feeling as well. And mm -hmm. my face pain turns on. And I, I bet if you somehow were able to look at the viral activity going on, my immune cells are just not quite in as good a shape at keeping everything under control. Uh, and then my wife says, you know, honey, you really can't be doing three lectures a month. We, we've agreed many times that you can only do one flight a month. How'd that go? I, I'm going to take over your schedule if, if, if you can't control it. Right. So, right. so as long as I pay attention to this is the right. pace that I can manage and this is the amount of sleep that I need, then I'm in great shape. Yeah. Because you only have so much reserve, you know? It's like mm -hmm. a certain amount of reserve that you build up, and then, you know, basically you get depleted. It's not, you know, it's, uh, it's, it sounds like for you, though, the threshold is much more tenuous because of your background and your, and, and well, your medical condition. But Correct. And actually, I, I'm, I'm so grateful now for my uh, face pain, Ellie. Um, mm. You know, I've had 27 years of, of progressively uh, horrific levels of pain. But now I feel like I have this amazing biosensor that tells me moment to moment, is my brain and spinal cord and cranial nerves, are they inflamed or not? If I have a little abnormal sensation here, I'm like, okay, what might that trigger have been? What do I have to adjust? I got to pay attention here. And as soon as I start getting those electrical jolts, that is like, okay. Um, you know, it's a family meeting time. I'm having a conversation with, with my wife. Okay, what do you think the trigger was? Uh, how am I doing in my self-care? What adjustments do I have to make? Uh, and so it now this keeps me honest. Like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very happy to follow the Walls Protocol because it, it, it's the only way to be pain-free. No, I remember hearing, I just listened to you for the first time at a lecture, which is a rare you know, treat for me that we cross paths. And I sat in the audience and I listened to your wonderful lecture that you gave for colleagues and medical physicians. And when you said that you reframed this pain as sort of this blessing, um, that it's sort of this bellwether of whether you've worked too hard or stressed yourself out too much mm -hmm. or kind of overdid it. I, I really found that an interesting way of framing something that would consistently be a horrible thing to have to have something hurting your head or you know your trigeminal neuralgia i just find that really interesting and empowering when you make it sort of your own tool as opposed to being a, a victim of your of your own physicality i thought that was just very interesting how you look at it that way so i now teach that to my patients and and the physicians who come work with me to get trained on uh using the loss protocol we talk about taking the person's symptoms, helping them identify what are their uh, most sensitive barometers of their health or disease state, and that is their biosensor. And teaching the patient how to use that, how to now embrace this biosensor as this amazing gift that will help them know and help them design their best self-care routine changing people's relationships with their their joints their bowels their skin their pain their now I'll, I'll tell you if it's if the anxiety depression panic are the main symptom that that's going to be a, a much harder task for that person because right uh, mental health uh, we, we have a little more difficulty with the insights for that but if it's a motor sensory uh, disturbance skin bowels People do very well with that, and they can do very well with the mental health. Um, but I let them know that yeah, it, it's a bigger it's a bigger challenge. The, the other thing I like to do, Ailey, is we talk about the hero story, the hero's journey. 
Yeah, explain that. You know, is, the most the most inspiring hero journey is someone who, in a society, is facing a, a, a terrible crisis. The risk of failure is great. It's going to be really hard, really, really hard. You don't know if you're going to make it. And then when they when they make progress, it is so heroic. Right. Uh, and so I ask them. You know, the, a hero story that's easy is, is not as boring. So you're blessed you have this really amazing hero story that will inspire your family, your friends, your neighbors, your children, your grandchildren to do great things and know that they can overcome really hard, hard circumstances. So what is your hero's yeah. journey going to look like? And if I can get that's them great. to lean into their... Uh, right. biosensor and lean into the hero story and acknowledge that, oh my God, this is hard. And I'm so glad it's hard because it's going to be so inspiring to the people who love you. I think it's incredible. And I think you have been something of a, a shining star and a miracle in this area because there's so few people that can honestly do the work that you're doing scientifically, having the training that you've had and go through it and be able to speak through it to people that you want to educate and, uh -huh. and your patients. So, but how many people have MS now? Let's go back to just very simple facts. Yeah. In the United States, is it growing? Is it increasing? Yeah, it, it's and, growing. And, or is it? It's doubled yeah. in the last 10 years. We're, we're over a million. Mm -hmm. um, it, people yeah. are being diagnosed younger and younger. Now, uh, pediatric onset MS, POMS, uh, is a thing. Uh, uh, kids as young as six are being diagnosed with MS. Uh, and then I, I will put in a plug in for neuroimmune. The, the, the conditions you take care of, Ailey, a lot of those folks also have neurologic psychiatric symptoms. So they have neuroimmune right. stuff. Uh, and so when they come see the neurologist at first, we're, we're sometimes working them up and say, oh, actually this is a, a rheumatologic problem. So we're going to hand you off to the rheumatologist. Um, so there's a lot of autoimmune stuff that is mm -hmm. filling over yeah, into the into sure. the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerve. Millions and millions of people, and this number is going to keep doubling. And why do you? I mean, how much of our environment? I mean, you know, this is the work of chemicals and environment, drinking yeah. water. You know, I emphasize. How much do you tell your patients and share with them the emphasis on? you know, clean food, but specifically USDA organic, water filters. Well, Tell me what your thoughts are on on that, given their backgrounds when, as well. When I was, um, my clinical time was at the VA. We took care of people living on food stamps, small uh, mm -hmm. grocery stores in rural Iowa, rural Missouri, rural mm -hmm. Illinois. Um, so we talk about, I want, implement the walls protocol. We, we teach them uh, how to cook, shop, meal plan, and... You know, do the best you can with your financial resources. Um, so people were, were buying conventional food. Interesting mm -hmm. enough, Ailey, uh, would also give them the environmental working group to prioritize what to get organically. Um, uh, they would get venison from their neighbors and friends. Uh, that was usually pretty easy. Venison, to, yeah. It's a different yeah. world than I'm used to, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah so, so they, they could get uh, their meat that way uh, pretty easily. Uh, and uh, they'd be getting uh, more and more uh, farmer's market uh, produce. Mm -hmm. And people would begin to figure out often how to get more organic food. But I, I want to yeah. stress, for because I have a lot of folks push back and say, you know, that's only for wealthy folks. They, nobody can, we can't do the Walsh Protocol because we're not doctors, we're not lawyers. And my response is, if I can teach the vets how to do it who are living on food stamps, you can do this. Um, you have to learn how to cook, to meal plan, to shop, to plan for leftovers. And it's okay to do this as a vegetarian uh, um, uh, uh beans and rice cooked in a Instapot pressure cooker. We can do it that way. It makes it more affordable. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can afford organic, you'll recover more quickly. If you can't mm -hmm. afford organic, just do the best you can and don't feel bad about it. How about water filters? Do you feel strongly, especially given your history in, in oh, Iowa? Oh, yeah, certainly with... water filters, air filters. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like yeah. to have people uh, do that as well. Um, yeah. uh, I like them to, the, most of the personal care products you don't need, just use soap and water, right. uh, and right. olive oil for your skin. That's really all you need. 
yeah. uh, maybe a little olive oil for your toothbrush or coconut oil for your toothbrush. And you don't need all these personal care products. Simple. Go back to simple. I mean, I think people have gotten way off the rails when it comes to sort of products and cleaning products and personal care. And we just buy so much junk that's marketed and, and so much of yeah. the human body just really needs to thrive without it. I, I mean, so but I'm glad to hear that you, you emphasize it within reason. I always say frozen organics. It's the yeah. one message so socioeconomically that maintains all the nutrient value. Mm -hmm. In terms of flash freezing, but also much cheaper and easy to, you know, cheaper, maintain and um, uh, easier. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, my, my vets taught me this really wonderful, wonderful uh, tip. So you go to the farmer's market, sort of walk around, you know, who's who. And at the end of the market, you go to the farmer say, how much for the for the balance we got left? So yeah. if, if you go at the end, you can often get. That's that really funny. bargain prices to uh, pick up uh, what's left. The other thing That's that my um, uh, vets taught me, and a lot of these guys, um, they really liked foraging. You know, we in the Midwest, there, there's, there's a huge amount of food that is edible for you in, uh, in the waste lots, uh, along streams, uh, in parks, mm -hmm. all these edible greens, uh, berries. Uh, if you quit spraying your yard, if you uh, own, own your home, quit spraying your yard, you'll see all sorts of edible uh, foods. Uh, dandelion greens, more, you know, um, yeah. garlic mustard. Uh, uh, there, there's lots of edible food uh, that is there that is just free for the taking. That's great. I mean, there's just so many hacks. It's just it's an, it's unfortunate we have to search out a lot of this on our own. Is Patients or even clinicians, you know, having to extra train, you know, it's a shame that it, this is not something that's built into modern well, day Western medicine. It's getting there, but it's, it, it's not soon enough. I think. And we should be teaching our children to uh, cook uh, as soon as they enter school. I mean, I'd love to yeah. see children have uh, cooking, not, not where you make mac and cheese from the box, but right. where you cook vegetables, <laughs> where, you, where you learn to cook beans and rice. Right where right. you learn to meal plan and use up all the food so we aren't throwing away our, our groceries right. and throwing away our food. You know, 40% of the food grown in the United States is thrown away. Shocking. And 40% of the groceries it. we buy are thrown away. Um, yeah. So we, we can make this very affordable, but we have to teach people to plan. Right get clever so tell me i know we're running out of time here but i know i want to i want you to tell us about the research that you're involved with currently yeah. what you're looking for in terms of participants because i know this is critical for everyone to learn from your research on multiple sclerosis um so please tell me a little about your research what you're looking for and also where we can find you moving yes. forward so we're, we're doing a new clinical trial comparing a ketogenic diet a um paleo diet that I've been saying for years, the modified paleo elimination, and the usual diet. Uh, so we have a control group. People will come in, get baseline assessments, uh, return in three months for a repeat lab check, and then uh, follow-up assessments at 24 months. Uh, we'll look at quality of life, uh, walking, uh, hand function, vision function, and MRIs at baseline at the end of the study. This will be huge. It will be the, one of the largest, longest dietary intervention studies in the setting of relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, age 18 uh, to 70. Uh, mm -hmm. The key thing is uh, we have to be able to confirm your diagnosis. Um, uh, uh, Allie, I'll give you the uh, uh, screen link so that people can complete the little screening survey. Uh, and then we'll contact you, get permission to verify your diagnosis, tell you more about the study and get you enrolled. And we, so we'll have all those links for yeah. anyone who's listening. I'm going to have the links for this study and also Dr. Walls's work. Can people be on medication or is that oh, a, yeah. Well, um, um, yeah. So if you're on meds, we want you to stay on your yeah. meds. If uh, things okay. happen during the two years you're with us and your medication needs to be changed or adjusted, that's perfectly fine. If you don't want to take meds, uh, that's fine. We, we, but you have to be willing to be randomized. In order to answer the question, does diet matter, we have to have a randomization and a control group. Now, Ailey, I, I will say that people who are in dietary studies are not like the usual public because we want to change our diet. We want to be better. We know full well that the 
usual care arm may improve their diet. They're not going to be eating the standard American diet. The, uh, all three arms are going to improve. We, that mm. we, we understand that. Uh, and we don't know, uh, will one of these uh, two intervention diets be better than the other? I, I don't really know. It's quite possible that the usual care arm, because they're not going to be eating the standard American diet, it's going to improve enough that I can't detect a difference between the three. But w- one of the most interesting questions we have, um, because <coughs> if you have MS, the rate of brain volume loss is three times that of healthy aging. Hmm. Which is why you know, cognitive problems and dementia and frailty are, are, are such a big problem with people with MS. One yeah. of our hypotheses, and I'm, I'm very excited about this one, is by it being on one of these diets, whether it's the ketogenic, the modified paleo, or usual diet, and people will, will improve the diet, because we're, we're going to give them tips every month on how to improve their diet. Can we get them to uh, healthy rates of aging? Mm. And I'm very hopeful that we can, that we will get people, because uh, we'll be knowing their brain volume loss rate uh, over that two-year period. And if we can get them down to 0.3% or less, that's healthy aging. That would be a huge landmark. That would say that, you know what, disease modifying, the, the effect of diet on brain volume is better mm-hmm. than uh, uh, drugs, or as good mm-hmm. as drugs. Probably, they're probably, good, yeah. probably saying uh, as good as drugs, uh, because I think brain volume loss is much more important than uh, lesions coming and going. Because people be on DMTs, lesions are, are pretty well suppressed with the DMTs. With the, the disease DMTs, modifying therapies. Yeah. Thank you. What the disease modifying therapies can have not been very good at is preventing brain volume loss. Mm. And, That's interesting. And, and the reason for that, we don't really know. I, I theorize that the reason they're not very good is that you need healthy mitochondria. Um, and that because if your mitochondria are, are struggling, uh, you're more likely to have myelin loss, more likely to have axon loss, more likely to have uh, neuron loss. This is all about really having excellent nutrition. Mm. And, you know, ideally, what I would, would love to do, and this, I, I'm not able to, to do this kind of study yet, but uh, someday I, I hope I can get back to it, is diet plus exercise together. I mean, that's what uh, obviously that's you need. That's anthropology. Anthropology. But, you know, the, the, you know, doing science is all painful. you got to do it one step at a time, one step at a time. So we're doing diet. Right. Um, the next day that we'd like to do would be diet plus exercise. Now, I think it's incredible. Um, you know, it seems like the more we get advanced in medicine, the more it comes back to the basic tenets of, of human development and, and anthropology, biology, and physiology. It's just remarkable how far we've gotten away from some of the basics of, of human wellness, you know? Um, but I think it's incredible. So if for this study, uh, just out of curiosity, so you don't have to live in state, you would just no. be coming in. You just have to be for... willing to come. And we have people okay. coming, uh, from Canada. Uh, mm-hmm. um, and so we have a couple of Canadians that have come down. We've got people coming from all over the country. Uh, we have people driving in, people flying in, uh, mm-hmm. we've, we've got 50, well, I think over 50 people that have consented. We want to have 156. So that means I'm looking for 106 more. So if you're listening, please, please screen. Uh, please tell all of your friends and your neighbors right. uh, that we have this amazing opportunity. Uh, we expect all three groups to improve. We think it's quite mm-hmm. possible that all three groups will improve equivalently. And that would be the very best news that mm-hmm. keto is great, paleo is great, and the usual diet with Monthly tips from us on how to improve your diet might be enough. What's modified paleo? What do you say when, when, when you say modified so, paleo? What do you the mean? Modified by that? Paleo, um, the modified paleo, the traditional paleo diet just tells you what to avoid. Yeah. Our paleo diet says, well, avoid that, but you got to eat this. So we want people eating uh, three cups of greens, three cups of cabbage, onion, mushroom, family vegetables, three cups of color, um, a little seaweed a couple times color, a month. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 
nutritional yeast, uh, meat, fish, liver once a week, oysters, okay. mussels, heart, uh, tongue, uh, gizzards. If you don't want to do, actually, that can be quite delicious. But I get if you, if you don't feel like doing that, um, uh, we we talk about some um, right. organ meat capsule options, and we had we okay. and we do have patients that do that. Interesting. Well, I'll tell you something. I'll keep my ears open. I see a lot of people on the East Coast for, for MS, but how do people, you know, I want to fill them and send them your way. So tell me and the audience, how do people reach you? How can patients come to see you as a, as a physician? Yeah. Are you still taking patients? Yeah, so I'm still taking patients. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's very exciting. Uh, for a couple of years during the pandemic, I did not, so we're back to seeing patients. Uh, so my website's terrywalls.com, T-E-R-Y, mm-hmm. walls, W-A-H-L-S.com. Across the top, there's a gold banner across the top. That's where you can screen for the survey. You can uh, find my research lab at uh, walls.lab.uiowa.edu. Or you could just mm-hmm. Google Walls Lab U Iowa, and that'll bring you to our research page. Uh, in there, when you go to our research page, you'll see a bunch of our uh, articles, uh, and you'll see the various podcasts. And then, Ailey, when you give me the links to this podcast, I'll get it uh, put up there as well. Uh, yeah, and wonderful. again, and if you want to see me, um, we um, have, again, the link uh, for the Wallace Institute on my website. Uh, and once, uh, I believe once a week, my team is, has a Zoom call of people to tell them the various programs that we have. Um, so there's some online programs, and then there is the come see me and work very closely with me option as well. Fantastic. Well, I got to tell you, it was an honor and a pleasure to have you finally, um, to finally meet you recently, and then also to have you say yes to being on my podcast. So I, I'm really appreciative of that. And you're doing such incredible work. And, and I appreciate it. I know the audience and your patients um, around the world do too. So keep doing your thing and, um, and, and stay well. Continue to do you know, all your improvements. It's, it's so inspiring. It's so inspiring. Thank you, Ellie.